It was about 20 years ago I was reviewing uh, applications for uh, admission to the graduate program at UCLA. And uh, Richard uh, McElrath, today's speaker, was uh, one of the applicants. And I was at the time looking for uh, mathematically oriented uh, undergraduates with a good training who could participate in what in those days my, my research program was mainly mathematical. And uh, so I looked at Richard's file and he was clearly a good student, all A's, uh, interesting courses but no mathematics, not a single mathematics course as an undergraduate. Uh, I worried about this, but <clears throat> also in the file was uh, a, um, a newspaper clipping. It's one of these columns, you know, where a reporter goes around and, and uh, asks five, uh, in this case, students, it was a newspaper clipping from the Emory campus newspaper, uh, about some question, you know, what do you think about the death penalty or what do you think about uh, whatever, question of the day. And Richard had included this with his, he was one of the interviewees, and I really wish I could remember what the, he said in that thing, uh, because it impressed me a lot. At first it impressed me he'd put a, new, <laughs> it would put a newspaper clipping in, the, in his graduate application, and then there was this typical Richard response. It was out of the box, it was incisive and forthright. So anyway, I dithered about in admitting this guy with no mathematics, I think mainly because of the newspaper clipping, he admitted to, um, he was admitted to UCLA. Uh, talk about something I shouldn't have worried about. Uh, Richard has come, gone on to be one of the premier mathematical theorists in the HBES world for sure, but I think in the, in the larger world of human behavioral ecology, uh, the kind of people who publish in uh, Evolution, AMNAT, places like that, uh, he's published a bunch of, of serious work. But even more than that, uh, he's gone on to become an authority in um, the new statistics. And uh, he has a forthcoming book which uh, entitled Rethinking Statistics, um, um, is, the, is the main title anyway. And uh, uh, having read through it, I think, uh, I predict it will become uh, extremely influential in how people in the human sciences and maybe more generally do statistics. It's a, it's a remarkable book. Of course, Richard is not just a mathematician. He's done serious fieldwork in Tanzania and the Faroes. Uh, he was instrumental in organizing a big set of cross-cultural economic game experiments uh, that were run uh, out of the MacArthur Foundation um, 10 years or so ago. He's developed a substantial uh, research program, experimental research program, both uh, 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 laboratory research and field research uh, at Davis. Um, so uh, he's a man for all subjects. Um, he's done most of his work at that uh, nirvana for evolutionary biologists, UC Davis, so he, let, he took up a job almost immediately after graduate school, after a short postdoc, and has been there ever since. Uh, but next year, um, I'm told, he will be moving to become, uh, to join uh, uh, Savante Pavo, Jean-Jacques Oblin, uh, Christoph Bosch, uh, who am I forgetting, Mike Tomasello, uh, as one of the directors of uh, a research unit uh, at the Max Planck Institute for um, uh, Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig. Uh, so um, please join me in welcoming Richard McElroy. Thank you, Rob. Uh, thank you all for coming on this morning, as uh, Karthik said last night, to hear about statistics. Uh, this will not be a typical statistics talk. It will mainly be about uh, the role of statistics in wider evolutionary science and something about the traditions of statistics as well, um, but not very much agonizing mathematics. Let me start by trying to just set a mood or offset the mood a bit. Uh, I think. My experience with statistics is like many graduate students' uh, experience with statistics is when you're introduced to it, um, there's this weird quest for stars. Uh, I jokingly call this stargazing, right? You've got some data, there are all these mysterious buttons you push and some asterisks come out if you're lucky. If they don't, you try some other buttons. Uh, and we all know that this is bad, uh, but the incentives to do it are very strong. Um, and I think there's been a lot of progress in consciousness about this being bad news for science in general. 
uh, since I was a graduate student, and I think that's a positive um, development. Uh, uh, and part of the problem, of course, is that the classical way physics is taught is divorced from the subject matter that each of us works on. So you're presented with these sort of horoscopic general frameworks like these flowcharts, okay? So uh, you go to the statistic consulting desk at any university and you get these flowcharts, they ask you to pick your test. Uh, and you go through these various procedures of picking something and this is the, the worst sort of choose your own adventure novel, right? Uh, and it seems like every fork in the road, there's a dragon on the left, uh, something you could do wrong and there will always be some statistician waiting to scold you for doing something wrong or violating some assumption. Um, I don't like to do that. <laughs> uh, uh, and this, this um, framework of going through flowcharts and choosing tests uh, has been evolving away in evolutionary biology over the last 30 years. Um, and so I wanna focus on today is really that evolutionary trajectory in statistical methodology. St statistics has a lot of math in it, but it's applied math, and like all branches of applied mathematics, it is cultural. It has its traditions and its tribes, and they fight over seemingly arbitrary things to the outsiders. Uh, but over the last 30 years in evolutionary biology, the the sort of non-null Bayesian tribe has been winning lots of field battles. Um, and other disciplines are starting to go in that direction as well. And I'd like to try to give you some sense of why I think that has happened. Um, uh, neither of these tribes is going to exterminate the other. I don't think that will happen either. Uh, but it's, it's worth getting a, a sense of the history of this subject and how it integrates with the quality of the scientific work we do. Um, and I'm gonna focus on uh, evolutionary questions. So, uh, the entry point for most of us in the, in the mythology of statistics is to think about uh, Sir Ronald Fisher, who had perhaps the greatest impact of any single statistician uh, who has ever lived on contemporary practice. In 1925, he wrote a very influential book uh, for research workers that was focused on uh, factorial experiments at agricultural research station here at Rothamsted uh, in England. And at Keyes College in London, there's this um, stained glass window commemorating the Latin square design that Fisher implemented, and it has been hugely productive in experimental design. Uh, and in this um, book, the, the tradition was set of null hypothesis testing. You want to figure out if some fertilizer is better than another. You, you reject the null hypothesis that they have the same average uh, effect on growth. Um, and a very strong rejection of Bayesian statistics found also in that book. All he says about Bayesian statistics in the introduction is, it is founded upon an error and it must be wholly rejected. Uh, and he maintained that view, as far as we can tell, his whole life. Um, however, Fisher did lots of other kinds of statistical work uh, which disagree with these principles in many ways, but this has been the major cultural influence is this tradition he set off to work on controlled agricultural experiments. Um, statistics is, of course, much older than Fisher. Um, Fisher was working within a long-standing tradition, which was actually dominantly Bayesian uh, up to that point. Uh, Bayesian statistics was about 200 years old by the time Fisher started writing. And uh, so, for example, um, in uh, physics and astronomy, Carl Gauss, uh, around, the, the, uh, around 1800, predicted the return of a comet named Ceres uh, using a very non-null model and using what we would now recognize as a Bayesian model fitting procedure um, to, to, well, he became famous in his 20s for actually predicting when this comet showed up again uh, using astronomical predictions. Um, and this is when least squares estimation was invented, by the way, that we now all use. Um, uh, and when Darwin, closer to our home turf, uh, when Darwin was thinking, Darwin wasn't very good at math, as he wrote in his notebooks, <laughs> uh, uh, but he was thinking, like Carl Gauss, along the lines of figuring out from the given evidence what sort of non-null process is going on. What's, what are the trajectories, not of a comet, but rather the trajectories of species as they trace out their histories and diversify and go extinct. We now would recognize this field as phylogenetics. Uh, Darwin didn't solve this problem statistically, but many people later picked it up and continued on with it. And in fact, I think uh, Darwin had a huge influence on what we call the statistical enlightenment that uh, occurred in the late 1800s because Francis Galton, an anthropologist, um, invented what we now would recognize as Bayesian conditional distributions by studying hereditary problems that were nominated from Darwin's work. Uh, that's what consumed Galton and 
uh, really, uh, Galton was the first person to write down what we now recognize as a standard Bayesian Gaussian estimation problem and this problem of regression and how it arises from conditional distributions. He built these cool machines, actually, that simulate Bayesian posterior distributions. Well, they weren't called that at the time, uh, but that's what they were. Um, and these days in evolutionary biology, especially in the study of human evolution, as I spend most of my time reading about, um, Bayesian methods are in the forefront. Uh, uh, null models have receded into the background, and instead the interest is in figuring, comparing multiple non-null models of, for example, the phylogenetic histories of the y, chrom y chromosome here, and at the same time integrating that with demographic estimates, a demographic model of the size of the human population in different regions of the world at different times. Uh, all these things are estimated at the same time, and it's a contest between competing non-null models of the evolutionary process. Uh, so those, those of us like myself, when I started out in school, who didn't have an education in what the heck Bayesian statistics is, this stuff is impenetrable. Uh, it's just mystical. There's a button that's pushed, the computer churns for a while, fans turn on, it has a little aneurysm, <laughs> right? And uh, then some numbers come out, and uh, they look pretty, and they can get you high-profile high publications. Uh, but what's really going on under the hood here, I want to say, is, is fairly simple-minded. It's merely writing down process models um, and asking uh, how consistent they are with, with the observed data. Um, so I want to give you a sense today of why this trend, I think, has happened. Um, the other thing I want to do is try to productively comment on the role of uh, these new, as we say, uh, statistical methods and the, the retreat of the null hypothesis in this debate about replication, the so-called replication crisis. Um, and uh, this is the thing that I get asked about most often. Can Bayes save us? And I'm just going to go ahead and answer that question. No, <laughs> uh, it cannot. Uh, uh, we can only save ourselves, <laughs> I think. Uh, but what I do want to say, if, if you haven't been following this, let me give you a quick idea of what the uh, crisis is about. Um, and it's not just confined to psychology, but I can't pass up a chance to pick on Daniel Kahneman. Uh, and uh, so here's a, here's a quote from his book, Thinking Fast and Slow. Um, when I describe priming studies to audiences, the reaction is often disbelief. The key idea, the idea you should focus on is that disbelief is not an option. The results are not made up. They are not statistical flukes. You have no choice but to accept the major conclusions of these th studies are true. Uh, unfortunately, when people try to replicate the very studies he cites in that book, they mainly do not replicate. Uh, this is something I'm, I'm sure he wishes he could take that particular quote back. Um, uh, and most of the strong conclusions uh, that he, the priming studies he talks about in that book have not replicated very well. Here's one example from the Mini Labs project, their third round of it. You can find it on the Open Science Framework. Um, the, the thing that only truly replicated here is the Stroop effect, all reliable Stroop effect, <laughs> uh, very strong. Um, everything else either retreats to smaller sizes or majority of the, of the priming effects um, look like they aren't really there at all. Original studies over here, very strong effects. And this is a pattern that has shown up in, in many priming studies and has caused a lot of anxiety as a result. Um, Really quickly, an example, to put some meat on this, uh, one of the examples from Kahneman, uh, this idea of disfluent fonts, uh, making people better at, say, the SAT. Uh, the idea is if you put the test in a hard-to-read typeface, that people will do better at it. This is exactly the kind of thing that soft psychology likes, right, because it's counterintuitive. It's like, wait, you make it harder to read and people do better? Publication, <laughs> right? And uh, uh, turns out it doesn't replicate. So the original study, um, had 40 individuals, and there's the effect size and the confidence interval. Um, here's a bunch of replications. Uh, one of them had uh, a large, large number of individuals in it. This is a mechanical Turk one. And uh, you can see it's right on zero, right? So um, there's no fraud involved in these sorts of things. It's just that any particular sample can trick us. So relying upon individual studies is dangerous. And it's uh, just saying that's sort of embarrassing, because of course that's true. But there are these conventions that we take single studies um, on face value without thinking about the general ecological and evolutionary context of scientific knowledge. That is, the, the population dynamic process by which we figure out over time what's true. And single studies, uh, my punchline will be, are never adequate. Uh, you don't need any fraud or any kind of statistical error at all for things like this to happen. Uh, it's just a standard feature of population dynamics. Um, 
I want to say uh, I'm sensitive to people picking on psychology about this because I don't think psychology is actually specially bad. <laughs> uh, there's just focus on it. It's just like an easy, easy person to pick on right now. Um, here's a, a quote from a, a fabulous uh, editorial from the editor of The Lancet uh, from April of this year. Uh, the case against science is straightforward. Much of the scientific literature, perhaps half, may simply be untrue, afflicted by studies with small sample sizes, tiny effects, invalid exploratory analyses, and flagrant contests of conflicts of interest together with an obsession for pursuing fashionable trends of dubious importance. Science has taken a turn towards darkness. <laughs> uh, the whole editorial is like this. It's, it's wonderful. You can just like root the whole time. Uh, he, he's mainly thinking of medicine. So think about this now. I mean, most of the work I do is, you know, it's about human evolution, and maybe it doesn't really matter. Uh, it's, it's a fun thing for us to think about, and I care passionately about it. But medicine really matters, right? Uh, they build drugs out of this stuff and procedures and surgeries. And uh, there's a, just as big a crisis in medicine as there is in soft psychology. Um, there's nothing special about psychology in that regard. Uh, what I want to say, though, is I, I, what I disagree with in that quote is the, the last part, that it's taken a turn towards darkness. I think it's always been dark. Uh, uh, it's, science is an uphill battle, struggling always, clawing against the universe to learn things from it. It's hostile to knowledge, right? And uh, as an example, uh, I've just finished reading this book called The Lost Elements, written by three um, chemists. And it's a history of the periodic table of elements, and it's mainly a history of false discoveries of elements. And as they say early on, and they document uh, throughout this 800-page book, uh, there are many more elemental discoveries later shown to be false than there are entries in the periodic table of elements. Uh, all the fields have had these problems. Now when we tell the mythology of the periodic table of elements, we'd say it was, it was just easy. We just cruised from one element to another, right? <laughs> we were just hit after hit. No, there was lots of mistakes. Uh, to give you an example, it isn't just fraudsters that did it. Uh, even famous people had false discoveries. There's Enrico Fermi, uh, one of the most famous physicists of the 20th century, receiving in 1938 the Nobel Prize in Physics uh, for his experiments in neutron bombardment, which are instrumental in discovering nuclear fission. In those very experiments he received the Nobel Prize for, he claimed discovery of two new chemical elements, alsonium and, and asparium, which, if you know your periodic table well, are not in it. <laughs> Right? They are not there. Uh, and in 1938, the very year he received the prize, um, uh, a German physicist showed that these things did not actually exist. Uh, no foul, though, right? Uh, this is just how it works. Uh, so to say it's not fraud, it's not necessarily error, it can happen to the most brilliant of scientists as well in any field. So here's the agenda now um, for the rest of the talk. Uh, I want to go through the, the evolutionary uh, trajectory in evolutionary biology, especially in the study of human evolution, in which there's been a retreat of null models and a rise of Bayesian inference. Um, and I want to call this part of the talk a tragedy in three acts. I want to give you some examples in empirical contexts of cases where null model statistics has frustrated discovery uh, and caused inferential problems. Um, and this isn't an argument that null models are never useful. It's just that in these particular cases, this has been part of the community's education that has led them away from them. Uh, uh, and then I'll comment about uh, how Bayes and information criteria, the so-called new statistics, integrate into this. Um, and then I'll quickly close up the talk by talking about population dynamics of science and how statistics plays a role in that, focusing on the quality of theorizing and how uh, null, the focus on the null hypothesis can frustrate that uh, as well. So act one. Uh, many of you will have heard of uh, the neutral theory of molecular evolution. Here we pictured some of the, the uh, greatest uh, theoretical population geneticists of the 20th century, uh, Jim Crow, uh, Sir Ronald Fisher, and Motu Kimura. Uh, Kimura uh, with Crow, uh, but mainly it was, it was Kimura's uh, uh, brainchild, came up with a very powerful and uh, compelling model of neutral evolution, neutral molecular evolution, not protein evolution. Uh, Kimura believed selection was important, just not necessarily at the molecular level. And, this set off a very productive debate uh, that went on for decades in the 20th century about um, how to understand the causes of molecular evolution, of evolution at the molecular level. Um, some of you may know uh, that uh, there was a kind of arch nemesis of Moto Kimura, uh, who was at UC Davis, John Gillespie. Uh, Gillespie uh, retired shortly after I became an assistant professor there. and, and uh, uh, not that Gillespie thought that selection mattered incredibly, it's that he, for every uh, 
every neutral distribution uh, Kimura could make, Gillespie could make a non-neutral model that mimicked it. Uh, it was like a game he played. Uh, and the two had a professional rivalry such that Gillespie was once uh, refused entry to a conference in Japan. Uh, and it got that nasty. Uh, and uh, so it was a serious issue. The scientific subject matter is important. And let me, I want to use this, uh, without going into the mathematical details of it, I want to use this as an example of how the focus on a null model, that is the neutral model of molecular evolution, caused a lot of frustration in empirical discovery. Um, and I, we can show this through this uh, comparison of models that arose. So generally first, um, the basic frustration in using statistics in scientific discovery, I think, is that the mappings between hypotheses and the process models of the world that we're trying to build and the statistical models we use to evaluate them is not one-to-one. -one. Uh, typically, there are many different process models that match any particular hypothesis, uh, kind of causally structured hypothesis, and many different statistical models that will match any particular process model. And this causes, this is the major problem with null models, the idea that you need only one model and ask whether it fits the data well and able to discover things. The problem is there are many null models, and non-null models can look like null models under certain views of the statistics. So in the context of the molecular evolution debate, um, we might start with our vague hypothesis evolution is neutral at the molecular level. Um, and the classical Kimura model is this neutral equilibrium model, equilibrium meaning equilibrium population size. Uh, the population has long enough at its given population size to, so that you get the comparative statics of it, the steady state prediction. Um, but there are many other neutral models in which selection is absent, and they make different predictions. Uh, just to nominate one more, you could have the non-equilibrium model. You can also have one in which population size is fluctuating through time, right? So you're never at equilibrium. Uh, and they make different predictions, uh, in fact. Um, all you need also is, is chromosomal structuring that, that is different, and you'll also get different predictions. Uh, so there are many uh, process models in which selection is absent, and they predict, make different predictions. Um, if you want to compare this now to uh, some vague hypothesis that selection matters, well, you can probably imagine there are many ways in which selection can matter, uh, and we probably haven't imagined most of them yet. Um, so in this debate, for example, the classic comparison that uh, people like Kimura were thinking of is the constant selection model, where there's a constant directionality uh, to natural selection. It favors a particular optimal value, so there's directional selection until the population gets near it, and then stabilizing selection. Um, people like Gillespie were instead interested in uh, the fact that um, ecologies don't stay stable for very long periods of geological time, so fluctuating selection is much more important. Uh, and it turns out, in one of the, the most intellectually satisfying mathematical facts of population genetics, that Kimura's neutral model, neutral equilibrium model, and Gillespie's fluctuating selection models make the same statistical predictions. Uh, it's really an amazing sort of proof, actually, to study. It's incredible and counterintuitive. Uh, Gillespie wrote in the paper in which he published this result that he was co completely surprised uh, by this result. I'm not sure that's true, but it was very kind of him to say it. <laughs> uh, anyway, this can happen in any sort of field. Uh, uh, all sorts of issues arise here. Now, in this particular debate, it, the conceptual problems led to 30 years of, uh, of basically unproductive statistical tests trying to reject the null model and failing to do so. Um, but that told us nothing because it could have been selection. Uh, it could have also been some other neutral model because power was low. Uh, so, um, but the idea that selection can imitate the null model wasn't on people's minds at the time. Uh, and I think it's because of this, what worked in agricultural trials that Fisher showed doesn't work in these more complicated scenarios. Uh, the data are much more high dimensional here. Empirically, of course, neutrality is important. Much of molecular evolution is neutral. But selection, we now know, structures the entire genome through processes like genetic draft. Because of linkage, even to understand neutral diversity, you have to account for the action of selection. And this, there's a consensus on this now. And this affects everything about phylogenetic inference and demographic inference in the past and how we understand rates of admixture with, uh, for example, Neanderthals uh, and so on. Um, the lesson that I think the, the human evolution community has taken from this, at least the, the theoretical population genetics community, is that you, it's not good enough to have a null model. You have to compare multiple non-null models, actual process models of what's happening. Um, and this is, so this has been a very productive debate, um, but it took 30 years to really hash out. Uh, just as a footnote on this, ecology has just gone through basically a parallel debate 
uh, largely in ignorance of what happened in population genetics, uh, which is no fault of theirs. You know, uh, the population geneticists were ignorant of this. So uh, a fellow named Hubble in, in around 2001 published a series of articles in a book on what's called the, the unified neutral theory of biodiversity and biogeography, uh, which is basically the theory that there are no niches. Uh, species are equivalent ecologically, right? And you're like, right away, you're like, no, it can't be, right? Like, all of ecology would be wrong if that were true. Uh, and uh, yet, it turned out to be very difficult to reject this null model. Why? For exactly the same reason as what happened in the molecular genetics debate. Uh, because when there are niches, the, the frequency distributions of species look the same <laughs> as when there aren't. Uh, so they went through a parallel, un, uh, sort of frustrating statistical debate. Um, and if they had been reading uh, Kimura, they would have saved themselves uh, some effort here, I think. This is a great article, by the way, if you want to catch up on this, by uh, Jim Clark, The Coherence Problem with the Unified Neutral Theory of Biodiversity. It kind of, he actually compares the two, a niche model and a non-niche model, and shows why they make the same predictions in the way that people look at the data. If you can look at the data a different way, you can tell them apart, but you won't realize that unless you really compare. All right, act two. Um, this will take us a little bit further from human evolution, and uh, the reason I want to do that is to show you that this is a general sort of phenomenon in evolution and ecology. Uh, this is a, a, a debate that within uh, community ecology that has raged for a while now and is, I think, now finally coming to some productive focus. Um, uh, and it's a debate about the co-occurrence of species, uh, the roles of competition, or more generally just interactions among species in structuring communities. Some species occupy similar niches, and so you might expect that they're not found together in the same geographic locations. Um, Jared Diamond at UCLA has started his career very famously working on this. Uh, things like uh, this beautiful bird on Bruni Island, uh, the birds of, of Melanesia and Micronesia, Austronesia, um, and their distributions on islands. And, the idea being that birds that are in similar what are called guilds, that have niche similarity, don't tend to overlap in their ranges, that they partition up the space. This makes a lot of sense. In fact, all this comes from Wallace, right? This goes back to, to Darwin's day. Um, well, uh, statistically, this is quite hard to do, um, to figure out. And uh, uh, null models have had a strong role in frustrating this sort of uh, debate. And I want to give you a very quick introduction to how that works. Here's the basic statistical problem. Imagine a really simple community with three species, a tree, which uh, negatively interacts, competes with two kinds of shrub. Those are shrubs. <laughs> and uh, uh, they're different shapes, right? Uh, and uh, there are strong negative interactions because uh, the tree shades the shrubs, and so they, they will tend not to be found together. But the two shrubs occupy similar niches, so they compete with one another as well. So there's negative interactions in, in, in all, all three pairs of species here. And now, if you get co-occurrence data, uh, observational data, which remember, ecology is mainly an observational science, much like human evolution. Um, uh, how do you figure this out, if these are the true relationships? Um, the problem is, when you just observe co-occurrence under this sort of statistical pattern, this is what you'll see. You'll see that the tree and the shrubs tend not to coexist, because this is a strong negative relationship, but the two shrubs do tend to coexist, and that's what happens in the observational data. So you need a more subtle statistical framework to pick this up. Um, that is the idea, you want to make this inference, uh, not this inference. And there are lots of naive statistical procedures that make this inference, uh, but people realized this problem quite early on. The original methods uh, to deal with this are complicated, um, but the debate really reached uh, a fever pitch in ecology uh, in the late 70s and early 80s um, because of this individual, Daniel Simberloff, who was at Tallahassee, I believe, at the time. And, uh, who argued used these null statistical models. Basically, they're, you take a matrix of species across their locations, and these, these early debates were all about islands, and you randomize this matrix, shuffle up the positions of the species, and you, act whether, you ask how often the actual distribution occurs in the tail area of the distribution of permuted matrices. It's a standard kind of matrix permutation approach like a Mantel test, if that's more familiar to some of you. Um, the, problem here, of course, and so on, based on that, uh, Simberloff argued that there's really no evidence that species suppress one another, uh, because it was very difficult to reject the null hypothesis in the data sets, in, Di in Jared Diamond's own data. Uh, this is what really got the fight going. <laughs> in Jared Diamond's own data, you couldn't reject the null. Um, so Jared Diamond wasn't going to let that stand, <laughs> and uh, here's a, 
Here's a quote from a very highly cited paper, Diamond and Gilpin, 1982. If you want to catch up on this, these are the two papers you should read. Um, the null hypothesis analysis by Connor and Simberloff is characterized by hidden structure, inefficiency, lack of common sense, imprudence, and statistical weakness, and ultimately by a scandalous disregard for their own procedure. It's like, wow, tell us how you really feel, Jared. This is, <laughs> right? <laughs> and in general, these papers are, are quite nasty. Uh, but they're nasty in that scientist sense, like they write this down and then they go have coffee or something, I think, right? Um, but this was, this was a big controversy in ecology, and I think it was mainly, I think Diamond and, and, and Gilpin were mainly right here, and we now know this because there's been a lot of simulation study of it. It's difficult to reject this null hypothesis, um, but that doesn't mean that it's true. Uh, it's, it's much more subtle than that. Um, one of the problems is that there are, again, multiple null models that are possible. And in particular, the null model that Simberloff used maintains the observed frequencies of the species. But of course, those are influenced by the very competition process you're trying to discover. So the process that you're trying to reject with the null model is baked into the permutation already. Uh, and that's one of the reasons uh, later, people later figured out that the null was accepted at very high rates. Um, these procedures have terrible statistical operating properties, these randomization matrix permutation procedures. And there's many different ways to permute a matrix, and that makes it even more complicated. Uh, so there's no unique null. Uh, then you're just into the area where I like to be, uh, compare, contrasting multiple non-null models. Um, of course, it's also frustrating because rejecting the null, when you do reject it, doesn't tell you what the interaction is. Uh, and that's what you'd really like to estimate, is those, those, in that path diagram, you'd like to know the coefficients. Um, and the power of the matrix permutation thing is very low as well. It misses very obvious interactions. Diamond liked in his papers to construct these things called checkerboard distributions, where species really just partition up the space in a checkerboard pattern of ones and zeros. And uh, the Simberloff null approach uh, would say that this was neutral, <laughs> that there was no competitive interactions involved in. So it missed even the strongest sort of cases. Um, recent paper, 2010, doing simulation studies shows that these matrix permutation things have really, really low power, sometimes the order of 1%, uh, and, and sometimes, ironically, also very high false discovery rates, around 90% of the time, depending upon how you tune it. This is a difficult signal detection problem. There's been a lot of progress recently in this. Here's a working paper from a PhD student at UC Davis who's um, on his committee, but this is entirely his work, uh, David Harris. And uh, he's been using Markov networks to recover these species interaction patterns. We have, uh, this is the red lines in this. I'm not gonna go through this in detail, just to say that there is hope at the end of this tunnel. You can recover the path coefficients in those species interaction diagrams with very high power. Uh, so th this debate has, has been productive in the long run, but frustrating in the short run. Um, third act is just one slide, uh, but I think it's a very important one. Uh, you may have heard that some of us, almost certainly me, share DNA with Neanderthals, <laughs> right? <laughs> and I'm very proud of that. <laughs> um, what you may not know is that from the start of the publication of that finding, uh, there has been a contest over alternative models. Uh, it turns out that really it's quite complicated to infer. Just showing that uh, uh, sequences found in Neanderthals are also found in some contemporary humans is not necessarily evidence of admixture between the two species. It could be that there was ancient substructure in Africa. That's been the main competing hypothesis illustrated by this bottom area here. The idea is that Neanderthals um, evolved from a uh, 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 hominin species that was in Northeast Africa and so shared some ancient sequences with them, some ancient neutral variation with them, or even, or even selected variation. There was then divergence, and then modern humans came from that same stock in Africa. And so it's just an accident of the ancient substructure that we share this DNA. Um, turns out that's probably wrong, but in order to prove that, you have to look more at the, the structure of the DNA sequences, and that is the length of the reads, that is the, the linkage uh, properties of those sequences. And that's what really supports the uh, gene flow or admixture hypothesis, in fact. It's much more structural. You can't simply reject the null hypothesis of there being no Neanderthal DNA in contemporary humans to demonstrate admixture. It's a fascinating uh, uh, statistical problem, um, and people are on top of it uh, from the beginning. Uh, this is, hasn't been a frustration. It's just null models have played no meaningful role uh, in this debate. Okay. So let me try to sum up this, this uh, tragedy in three acts, uh, what I really think about the null hypothesis uh, such. 
Uh, null hypotheses can be productive for focusing our mind, but to really do statistical work, uh, we need non-null models. We need to have multiple models that we compete fairly against the data. And that's what I think has led to lessons like these, these three acts have uh, led to this evolutionary trend in evolutionary biology away from null models and towards broadly capable model fitting um, technologies, Bayesian inference merely being one of the available options. Uh, so this has been true in the study of origins, as I mentioned here, speciation, admixture, integration, and, and selective sweeps. All of phylogenetics has been revolutionized by the use of non-null models and Bayesian inference. Uh, for the sort of things that people like ourselves are interested in, often behavior development and diversity of the human species, it's not a, enough, I think, to show that kinship matters. We, want, we actually have a theory about how it should matter, and that's what we try to push. Right? It isn't enough to reject the null that, you know, blood relatedness doesn't matter because there are lots of theories about it mattering. We have a theory that says how it should matter and that's what we should be leveraging. Um, of course, uh, null ontogeny is not a thing that can be defined, right? So uh, the study of ontogenetics is uh, a study of non-null models. The comparative method um, depends upon often a use of null models, but in that area, as in phylogenetics, there isn't a unique null model. So there are interesting and productive debates about whether Brownian motion models or more selection-based models should be the null. Uh, in these comparative methods as well. And I want to give a call out to Mary Towner and Barney Lutbeg. They wrote a great paper in 2007 on studying sex ratio and Trivers Willard's effects, which uh, just ask you to read it, was in evolutionary anthropology, which goes through how null models in that area can lead to a lot of confusion as well. Um, so we can do better by having multiple non null models of the process. Uh, so this brings us to Bayes um, and, a, and a plug on my book. Uh, so people often ask me, uh, is this problem in the replication crisis, uh, can we solve this by switching to Bayesian statistics? And I think the answer is no. Uh, so, I mean, first of all, you can do null hypothesis testing in a Bayesian framework, too. It, it's really, all Bayesian inference is, is a way of extracting information from data relevant to a model. But it's not a theory of models. Uh, you, the model is up to you uh, and your, and your uh, uh, conventional background. Um, it's just, a, as I say, a robust way to fit arbitrary statistical models to data. In fact, probably the most as given the methods we currently know, the most robust way. And that's why it's become so dominant in evolutionary biology. Um, I think as a side effect, a sociological side effect, a, a benefit of Bayesian inference is it focuses your mind on generative models. All Bayesian models are generative. They, they can produce data uh, if you run them one direction, and then they estimate parameters of the model if you were given data if you run them the other direction. Uh, so when you, it, when you interrogate or focus on a Bayesian model, it it forces you to think about the generative processes you're trying to model. That's why, they've, again, it's been so important in, in population genetics and human evolution. But it won't fix science because, as I'm going to talk about in the remainder of this talk, uh, lots of other things matter. Uh, this is only one tiny little piece of the population dynamics of how we discover things about the world. Um, and it's really not up to solving the whole problem. You can't encapsulate the scientific method into a statistical procedure, which is obviously true once you say it, and yet we're shocked when Occasionally, papers turn out to be wrong. Like, we've been betrayed by the literature. Something was wrong, <laughs> right? Uh, I think that's normal uh, for things to be wrong. Uh, the second uh, thing is information criteria, which, uh, like AIC and DIC and WAIC, um, these are, are useful technologies because they help us focus on multiple non-null models. They let us compete in a statistically principled way, different process models of the same data. And they will tell us things like the data don't discriminate, as well as give us measure, quantitative measures of how discriminating uh, the models are. And again, they focus on, uh, it's great that they focus on model uncertainty. They quantify uh, like uh, uh, sampling distributions for parameters or posterior distributions for parameters, quantify the uncertainty in estimates of tunable bits of each model. Information criteria give us measures of uncertainty for models, uh, which is just as big a problem. Uh, perhaps a bigger problem as well. But again, these don't fix science because there's no theory of where the models come from here, and it's just a one small part of, of the broader dynamic. Um, I should say, if you're interested in, the book is done, but because of the way uh, publishers work, it's coming out in February next year because of course adoption cycles and things, things like that. If you want uh, the PDF of it, though, you, you can easily go to my website and you'll find a link there, and there'll be a password, and the password is the second word in the title. Uh, all in lowercase, uh, you can get access to everything if you like. Um, okay, so what I kept saying that it's data analysis is just one small part. Uh, here's a, 
very incomplete list of all the sorts of forces that matter in uh, the population process of scientific discovery. And there's a tendency to focus criticism on data analysis. It's the thing that maybe we feel like we have some control over, or maybe they're, it's just because people are scolding us for doing it wrong all the time. Uh, but these other things are perhaps uh, are just as important or more important, and there, there are smaller literatures in all of them as well. Um, so let me focus on uh, one of the most important things, and, and because this one, I think, interacts with the null hypothesis tradition quite strongly, and that is the quality of our theorizing, what is called in um, uh, statistics the base rate uh, of true hypotheses. And to, to make this meaningful to you, there's this kind of folk philosophy of science across basically all the sciences, that it doesn't matter where your theory comes from. Uh, you apply the scientific method to it, and we can discover whether it's true or not. Uh, Karl Popper uh, argued that in his early books. He later walked it back. Um, it's wrong. It's absolutely wrong. And why is it wrong? It's because in the population process, if you spend all your time testing bad ideas, you will fill the literature with wrong stuff, with false positives. Uh, and let me try to explain that problem to you. And the point of this, to get to the punchline, is we have to be better theorists, and that's really hard because no one knows how to do it. <laughs> uh, but you have to be better theorists. Um, okay, so let's let's talk about the base. I'm gonna, I, know, I know somebody's getting this joke. I'm glad. <laughs> All right. So we're, let's assume, for example, we have some statistical procedure in which the probability of a false positive finding is five percent. That's the standard kind of uh, type one error rate that is on the sticker, right, of the stats software. Uh, the probability of true positive finding about 50%, we often call this power. Um, so then we ask the question, what's the probability of positive finding? We've, we've run our statistical model, we've gazed at the stars, we got some asterisks, hallelujah, you can get a dissertation now, <laughs> right? And, but what's the probability that positive finding actually indicates your hypothesis is true? This is a very hard inferential problem, and you can give this little kind of quiz to lots of people, even statistics teachers. And the most common answer is also wrong, and it's that the probability is 0.95, or a 95% chance that it is actually a true hypothesis. It is typically much lower than this. Um, so the way to compute the actual answer is very confusing. Uh, you use Bayes' theorem and uh, to invert the probability, to get the probability that the hypothesis is true conditional on a signal that it's true. This is like signal detection, those of you who are familiar with that. You use this formula that is hard for most people to remember. Uh, there's, there's a whole lot of junk, and you have to get it all in the right places, right? And uh, the thing that isn't up here in the given information that we need is called the base rate. Um, and what is, and this base rate is incredibly important. It's the most single important number that you need to know. And sadly, we don't know it. Uh, but base rate is low when your theory is bad, <laughs> right? And base rate is high when your theory is good. So let me try to give you an animated view of what base rate is like uh, real quick. So uh, what we're looking at here is an imaginary case where we've got 100 different hypotheses. Each square is a hypothesis. The gre green ones are actually true. You don't know that when you go in to test them. And the blue ones are actually false, and you don't know that when you go in to test them. Now, let's say we test every one of these. We run an experiment to do every one of these. These could be things like um, loci in the genome. In genome-wide association studies, there's this big business in medical genetics of looking for genes that are linked to particular medical phenotypes. Uh, so you test 100 different loci. 10 of them are actually associated with the phenotype of interest. 90 of them are not. This is a base rate of 10%. Uh, so what happens when you run this? Well, given the operating characteristics on the, on the former slide, on average what happens is half of the green ones are pulled out as positive results because that's our power, is 50%. Uh, so we get five of those 10. Uh, and we get five of the blue ones also show up as positive results, right? We have a very low type one error rate. Uh, but we get the same number of false ones showing up as positive results as true ones because there are so many more false hypotheses, uh, so many more loci that aren't actually associated with it. Um, outside of genomics, this would be true of, say, in soft psychology when, when people just say, you know, I kind of think that when people hold a warm coffee mug, it makes them happier, <laughs> right? <laughs> Pick on a particular result. And uh, that's a big result, I'm told. I don't know. Uh, and... Uh, Maybe it's true, but it doesn't look like it's faring well. And um, so if uh, theory is like that, you end up with lots of false things. And even if your type 1 error rate is low, um, you're going to end up uh, with a lot of false positives in the positive heap. And now the probability that something is actually true conditional on the positive is only a coin flip. 
uh, which doesn't sound like a great advertisement for science, right? Things in journals, there's an even chance they're right. <laughs> um, I think that may be right, and that's what, for example, Richard Horton, the editor of The Lancet, is talking about, is uh, empirically, audit studies uh, back this idea up quite a lot. But this is not a disaster. I think it's always been this way. Uh, and the problem is to focus on single papers and assume that they are sufficient to make it work. Uh, we're always going to need replication is what I want to get to. Um, so this is what we actually see, right? We just see that there are some positive things and negative things, and we don't know the base rate. And until people publish the result of every hypothesis they test, which I think we can all agree is not what's going on, uh, we can't know the base rate. Um, Paul Smaldino and I have tried to get data that would let us estimate the base rate in various fields, and it isn't out there. It's very frustrating. We're, we're designing a study where we could do it, but it's, uh, it's, it's kind of depressing how little auditing of this stuff there is. Okay, what we do know about base rate is in various fields, it turns out to be, uh, we can't estimate it exactly, but it looks like it's kind of low. So I mentioned the, the chemistry case. More than half of elemental discoveries were false. Uh, they were being discovered at very high rates because there was a lot of prestige to getting an element named after yourself. Um, and, uh, but most of them turned out not to be true. In the end, we do have a table of elements, which we think is right. Um, in medicine, this is what Horton was talking about, eight of 10 published findings cannot be repeated. That doesn't mean that they're false, it's just maybe there's some skill in the cooking and no one can quite figure out what's going on, but it's not encouraging. Uh, in psychology, of course, you know, the replication rate is not looking great. Some areas are doing better than others, but overall, uh, lots of the textbooks are wrong. Um, neuroscience uh, is one of the worst case scenarios. Many published associations cannot be repeated. Um, and also their statistics are, are generate false positives at really high rates. Um, uh, they're cleaning up their house, though. Uh, genomics, uh, I've talked about already, most gene phenotype associations cannot be replicated. Um, there's a huge, because the base rate in genomics is really, really low. If you do a whole genome study, it's like, the base rate's like 10 to the negative fifth. So almost every positive result is false. Uh, it's a massive waste of money. <laughs> um, uh, and then anthropology and ecology, to pick on my own fields. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, <laughs> replicate my work. I dare you. Go ahead, try. <laughs> right? I mean, so think about field sciences. It's, uh, uh, this is, a, no, this is, we laugh about it, but we laugh because the alternative is to cry. Right? <laughs> um, so I don't know what the base rate is in my fields, but I, I, I'm not hopeful. Uh, the important thing to take from this is, the, this is all data about the rate of true published findings. The base rate has got to be lower than this if you believe that peer review works at all, right? That the statistical instrument is actually picking up a uh, signal. And I think, I think it is, even bad methods do, um, except maybe those matrix permutation things. Uh, so uh, base rate could be quite low in lots of fields because people are getting lots of, of null results and they're not publishing them. And that's what prevents us from uh, estimating the base rate. Um, so. Why is the base rate low? Uh, I don't think anyone knows, and I don't have a strong opinion about this, but I, I have speculations that I'd be interested in, in chatting with many of you over the remainder of the week about. I think, well, the first thing to say is science is hard. Uh, it shouldn't be surprising that it's hard to figure out how the universe works, because the universe is complicated, and we have pretty meager individual intellects. Um, uh, let's say that the truth is rare. The history of science teaches us that most hypotheses have been false. Uh, that's a great estimate of the base rate right there. Um, Darwin, for example, was wrong about a lot of things. That's okay. He was right about a very important thing. Uh, the null hypothesis syndrome uh, is a, a vague cover that I used to talk about how focusing on a statistical procedure as the null leads people to neglect the construction, detailed construction of the actual research hypothesis. Um, so uh, uh, Paul Meal, uh, was a psychologist um, in the second half of the 20th century, used to make fun of his own field by saying, in physics, if you had inclined planes and you uh, different inclinations and you rolled balls down them, you need your theory to predict how fast the different balls would accelerate exactly to verify your theory. Uh, but in psychology, you just have to predict that one would be faster than the other, <laughs> right? And that, that was the, a big problem in leading to vague hypotheses in soft psychology. Um, it's not just a thing about psychology. It's also true in the majority of organismal biology that it's like that. You just predict that things are going to be different. Well, how? And wh what are all the different theories about how that difference could arise? Um, Low quality theorizing will reduce the base rate if we merely rely upon verbal metaphor, uh, rhetoric, uh, and I say bad math because it, peer review in mathematical theory I think is abysmally bad. 
Uh, it's hard work, that's why it's bad. And so there, even in statistics, um, Naaman of Naaman Pearson fame did ANOVA statistics wrong, <laughs> had this famous debate with Fisher. And that debate went on unreasonably long because Fisher wrote immediately after the publication that Naaman had done the math wrong. And people ignored it. <laughs> uh, Naaman students went on using the bad math for three decades. Uh, so you have to be, as a mathematical theorist myself, I think we have to be very circumspect about uh, not trusting our math necessarily. Um, and then Harking, uh, which is hypothesizing after results are known, that is guaranteed to make the base rate bad because that lets you translate false positives into theories, right, into bad theories. Uh, but a lot of Harking goes on, I'm pretty sure. Okay. Um, so. I like to flatter my field uh, by thinking that you know, evolutionary theory has been quite successful, one of the most successful bodies of, of theory um, of the uh, uh, 19th, 20th, and hopefully 21st centuries. Uh, so does this mean our base rate is higher? Uh, maybe it does, but so uh, I think we should fight. I'm always trying to personally fight the inclination to be self-congratulatory in this regard. Uh, the first problem is, uh, Evolutionary theory is often explanatory, but often not very predictive. So consider for a fact that Darwin may mainly explained facts that were already known. Uh, it wasn't a predictive theory about what was going to happen. You, you can't predict the future diversification of songbirds. And it turns out uh, predictive ecology is a very, very difficult thing to do. And that's not surprising because the theory itself says that evolution will be historically contingent. Uh, and there are developmental constraints and, and uh, standing variation matters when the environment changes and all sorts of things that are very difficult to measure and understand the dynamics of. Um, so, of course, whatever uh, uh, behavior we do observe or morphology we do observe is going to have an evolutionary explanation. Uh, but predicting that explanation has turned out to be quite difficult. Um, dynamics are complex, so classical intuitive causality models don't really work well in population dynamics. It's everything can cause everything in highly nonlinear systems. It's very frustrating, but it's also what makes it so much fun. Um, and of course, in the sociology of the science of evolution, uh, our success is the sum of many studies over time. Individual studies can be flawed, but it's a process of weeding out, just like natural selection uh, on genetics is a process of weeding out mutations. Uh, not every organism is correct, right? Not every paper uh, is correct in science. Okay, let me return to this table. Um, in the last couple of minutes here, what I want to say is I think to understand these issues, uh, the population dynamics of science, it would be good to have models of science as a cultural evolutionary system. Um, and that has long been called for, but there hasn't been much work along those lines. Um, uh, so let me talk about a little bit of work that I've been doing with Paul uh, Smaldino, uh, making analytical models, population models, of the scientific discovery process, just building in a few of these features to get a start. Um, and it turns out there's really no work along these lines. Uh, people dabble in a few things. And we discovered why, is because it's really hard. <laughs> Uh, uh, so, to sketch this for you, what the idea is, and I just want this to be conceptual, to, to spur your imaginations, the, the focus of main debates and the focus of most of this talk has been the operating characteristics of the statistical procedures we use to process our data. Uh, sometimes our research methods are measurements as well. So in the classic thing, there's the real truth of the hypothesis, it's either true or false. Uh, there's some signal we get, we apply some mechanism, it could be Bayesian, it could be not, still, there's a signal. Uh, uh, and in the standard folk model of this, you decide based upon some threshold whether the signal indicates a positive result or a negative result. Um, you can do this whole thing with quantitative estimation as well. It doesn't change uh, uh, the dynamics. Um, then all the stuff that is positive result is classified as positive, uh, and all the stuff that gives you a negative result is negative. But these are both mixed bags, right? I hope I've showed you. Um, this is just part of a larger ecology, a population dynamic of discovery, of learning within the community of science. And um, the first, and, and what I've talked about importantly, is the base rate, which takes place up here from novel hypotheses. There's some rate at which they're true. Lots of them are often not true. That's why they're red <laughs> in this. Uh, and those things then feed into the investigations, uh, which produces flows into the monstrous publication system, <laughs> what we call communication, or now Twitter, right? Uh, and all sorts of things happen. Some things go into the file drawer. Uh, angry reviewers tell you that your result doesn't agree with theirs, so it's hard to publish it. Uh, lots of complicated dynamics arise there to get into the public record. Uh, 
Um, and then uh, uh, repeat studies can be based upon things that do make it into the publication system. So all I want you to get from this is that qualitatively, it's hard to know just from the operating characteristics of a statistical procedure whether that's sufficient uh, uh, to actually learn the truth about a, a process. The other components feed those things around in complicated ways. So just as like population structure matters hugely in evolutionary outcomes. It isn't enough just to know what's adaptive. You can get sinks because of migration patterns, and there's lots of maladaptation in nature as a consequence of population structure. The same happens in science. Um, so uh, math ensued. Uh, I'm not gonna go through the math, but just to say you can write down recursions for the meta-analytic properties of different hypotheses uh, in this kind of system, and we solved this uh, exactly. Uh, it was a long, uh, distraught process, but we managed to get exact solutions to the system. And um, uh, I'm not going to go through the results again. This is just supposed to be uh, uh, help your imaginations. Uh, but from this, you can look at, under different um, scientific ecologies, how many replications are needed to reach different rates of uh, true hypotheses at those amounts of replications. And we've, we've discovered, I think, lots of counterintuitive results in this. Um, and I'm not going to walk through it. I just want to focus you on what it does hold up is that base rate and false positive are the most important things in this particular model of the system. I've said a lot about base rate. Getting up the base rate is really crucial. Anything we can do to vet our theory better and have multiple competing hypotheses and to be honest about the hypotheses we test and not hark them uh, will help a great deal. Um, false positive rate I haven't had much to say about and I have no time to discuss it. It's equally important. Uh, that's a whole other talk. So maybe I'll talk to some of you uh, over beers about that later. Um, very important problem. All right, so let me sum up. I think I'm on time. Is that right? All right. Uh, so I think the second half of the 20th century and moving on into the 21st centuries now, there have been two dominant evolutionary trends in statistics for studying human evolution. The uh, first is the decline of the null hypothesis, uh, which is very important in the first half of the 20th century and remains important in many research programs, but is has uh, gotten a bad rap uh, because of its operating characteristics. The major problems being there are a lack of unique predictions for nulls. Uh, there are many different nulls uh, that are reasonable. Um, and nulls often trade on the idea that they're unique and natural and important. And that's rarely true. Um, they're silent on what actually did happen. So when you reject the null, it doesn't tell you what process actually went on. And it may distract us more sociologically from building the generative models that we need to make detailed predictions of what actually happened, to say what is actually there when kids are learning, for example. Clark makes this uh, point in his book very well, I think. Um, I do believe that the null hypothesis will live on. It isn't that it's useless, and every research program has, begins often with just some, what if things were random? <laughs> uh, what would things look like? But what it moves on happily happen from there is you have to define what random means, and it's very important to realize uh, uh, that random is a state of information. The world is not random. What's random is our knowledge of the world. Coins are not random. It's that we don't know the initial conditions of the physics, <laughs> the angular velocity of the coin, so we can't say which side will come up. Uh, and that is the Bayesian view of probability that has uh, also risen in, in the second half of the 20th century, uh, which has a focus on generative models of process. You can go straight from your theorizing to the data, use the same models to fit them. Um, a focus on multiple non-null models in a natural way to compete them against one another. It's easy to include diverse sources of error, measurement error, uncertainty in phylogenetic inference, um, uh, uh, missing values, all those things can be blended into Bayesian models these days uh, quite easily and transparently. Uh, it's much more frustrating to do it in other approaches. Um, and uh, very importantly, uh, the Bayesian approach works with experimental data as well as observational fieldwork data. You can port the models back and forth. And that's been important to me in my own studies of social learning is the idea of using the same sorts of social learning models in both contexts. Uh, so this brings us back to Fisher. I don't want this talk to end with me sort of saying like Fisher was bad. Uh, Fisher agreed with all this. It's sort of an accident that his agricultural methods were blown up into this big edifice of universal statistics, which is not what he really argued for. Here's a great quote uh, from William Cochrane's famous book on observational studies. Cochrane studied with Fisher when uh, Fisher was at um, Keyes College and uh, reports this in the book. Uh, uh, when asked what can be done in observational studies to clarify causation, uh, Sir Ronald Fisher replied, make your theories elaborate. Um, what Sir Ronald meant, as subsequent discussion showed, 
was that one should envision as many different consequences of its truth as possible and plan observational studies to discover whether each of these consequences could be found to hold. So this is the, the mandate to use your process model and multiple ones and see what they actually predict and design studies that give you quality measurements that can really contradict those observations. So this is completely consistent with the Popperian view of science because remember in the Popperian view of falsification, you're rejecting your model, not the null. Right, so there's this idea that, that null hypothesis rejection is consistent with popperism. It's an inversion of it, right? Uh, Popper wanted us to reject our hypotheses, not some null model of what was going on. Uh, and that's what Fisher uh, and Cochrane and myself uh, agree with as well. Um, okay, let me sum up here. Uh, breaking science is hard, right? Uh, you knew that, but I hope I've given you a lot more ammunition to support that inference. Even null models are mostly wrong, of course. Uh, it's very hard to learn about the world. Bayesian inference is great. Uh, you should all do it. <laughs> uh, I think it'll help you understand statistics because it's, it's not at all superstitious. It's just a way to count up all the ways things could happen and ask how many of those ways are consistent with your data. Um, so, uh, but it isn't gonna fix science all by itself. It's just a way to extract information from data. Individual contributions to science can really, our individual contributions, nobody's, can really live up to the legends we develop in textbooks because the legends drop all the errors. Think about the, the periodic table of elements again. Uh, so it's not necessarily bad news that we're publishing false stuff. The only bad news is that we tend to think that everything in journals is right. And think about it, people do think that. I've had arguments with people <laughs> about that. Uh, but it doesn't mean science is broken. Uh, Instead, what we should be thinking about is designing scientific institutions to better channel the population dynamics. And that will, I think this is a case where the evolutionary scientists have a lot to contribute because we study evolutionary processes. And for the most part, social sciences don't. This is something where the HBS audience has a leg up. You think about population dynamics when you're an evolutionary scientist, and you think about diffuse forces uh, flowing through systems, and that's how science is actually working. And Donald T. Campbell, to give him credit, wrote a lot about this and uh, converted Karl Popper to this view, if I understand the history right. Um, called it evolutionary epistemology. You wanted to develop an idea about how forces analogous to natural selection work on scientific ideas, uh, but we have to work to structure uh, the incentives uh, in productive ways. Um, and of course, the, the open data, open materials, pre-registration, uh, reproducibility initiatives are part of this restructuring of, of uh, uh, scientific institutions to make all of these processes forces more efficient for getting more truth. Thank you all for your indulgence, uh, and I hope to talk to the rest of you throughout the day. <laughs>